Well, good morning or good afternoon, folks. As you are uh, joining our session today, we would say good morning, good afternoon. We'll say aloha. We'll say half a day wherever you are because we have folks joining us today from every possible time zone in the continental USA, as well as into the Pacific and Hawaii and on to Guam. So whatever time of day or morning it is, greetings. We're glad you're here and welcome to day two of NASB's 2021 Legislative Conference. Now, today we want to continue the robust discussions that we started yesterday about the current landscape of federal education policy. And we want to provide some context for the decisions that you as state board members are grappling with in each of your states. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to explore the landscape of federal education policy making from various perspectives. We heard from Representative Bobby Scott, Chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee, and he gave us a sense of the state of play in the congressional arena and gave us some uh, insights on, um, on what he anticipated would happen. And some, he gave us some great points on things he thinks state boards need to be focusing on. Then we spent time with the new Secretary of Education, Dr. Cardona, for a candid look at the Department of Education's policy priorities, as well as the anticipated focus of the Biden administration. And uh, I don't know about you, but one of the highlights for me yesterday were the two panels with parents, teachers, and students. They gave us great insight on to, into how they are uh, seeing the, the policy landscape and what is needed from state boards at this time. And then finally, we ended yesterday by looking at the state of play with education committees um, in both houses of, um, of Congress and how best to use our Board of Education voice to influence policy at that level. So we're going to now continue that conversation by looking at yet another perspective on federal policymaking. Uh, with a panel of folks that can provide us with a unique perspective on the relationship between the work of the White House and the Department of Education. We're calling this, converse, calling this session a conversation about moving forward post-pandemic. And that's exactly what we want this to be, a conversation. So today, my role is to simply tee up some questions and get out of the way as uh, we let our panelists uh, give some advice and some insight on the state of play federally, as well as what the, uh, some recommendations for state boards. And the folks that are joining us today are really very uh, uh, well equipped to have this conversation with us. And uh, I'll do a brief introduction, then we'll get started. We're first joined by Holly uh, Kuzmich, and then Andy Rotherham and Emma Videra. Now, Holly serves as executive director of the uh, George W. Bush Institute, whose work focuses on education reform, military service, economic growth, human freedom and democracy, global health, and women's empowerment. Holly also oversees the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, which is a unique leadership development program in collaboration with the Clinton Foundation, the George H. W. Bush Foundation, and the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation. In addition to her role at the Institute, she also serves in a management role as Senior Vice President of the Bush Center. Now today, the perspective she's bringing to her to the panel is that the time that she served in the Department of Education as a Deputy Chief of Staff, among some other roles, and she came to the department from the White House Domestic Policy Council, where she served as Associate Director of Education. So that's the perspective that she'll be leading, lending to us today. And also joining us is Andy Rotherham, no stranger to NASB, one of our great partners and friends. Andy's the co-founder and partner at Bellwether Education Partners, a national nonprofit organization working to support education innovation and improve outcomes for underserved students. He's also a contributing editor to US News and World Report and a senior editor at The 74, an education news and analysis publication. And Andy also writes the blog, EduWonk, uh, dot com, which I'm sure is on the top of your reading list as it is mine, and he is, uh, teaches at the University of Virginia and is senior advisor for Whiteboard Advisors. Now, uh, the perspective today that Andy's bringing is that he previously served at the White House as special assistant to the president for domestic policy during the Clinton administration, and he sat in the same seat as you as a member of the Virginia State Board of Education, so a unique perspective that he's offering. And they're also joined by Emma Videra, who is the executive director of Next 100, a startup think tank to the next generation of policy leaders and a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Emma was chief of staff for the U.S. Department of Education during the Obama administration, serving under both Secretary John King and Secretary Arne Duncan. As chief of staff, she worked closely with the White House 
and across the department to develop, execute, and oversee the administration's pre-K through college education agenda. And from nine, uh, 2009 to 2011, she served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the Department of Education, overseeing K-12 education policy development. So we have a very well-equipped panelist today to, to uh, help us delve into some um, really important issues. So panelists, the folks that you're talking to today are State Board of Education members, and they pretty well understand the, the, uh, the relationships that exist at the state level because they work regularly with their chief, with the Department of Education, with the governor, with the legislature. They pretty well are familiar with those relationships. But um, kind of a mystery to them is the relationship at the federal level with the Department of Education, with the White House, with all of those, those different players in, in uh, affording a federal agenda. So we'd like to pull back the curtain a little bit, if you would, and uh, uh, share with us just a little bit um, about what that relationship looked like during your tenure, working between those relationships, and then also maybe some um, looking forward to what you see this current uh, relationship between the two. So I'm just going to throw it out there. I, Holly, I see you're unmuted. I'm going to let you start. So um, that's it, Robert, great question. Thanks for having me, first of all. It's great to be here. And thank you to all the, the state board members that are participating for serving. It's an important, important job. Um, the relationship between the White House and the Department of Education, number one, so I was on both sides. I was in the White House for three years of the Bush administration, then went in the second term to the department. Um, the thing that was a little interesting for me was my boss was the same in both cases. I had Margaret Spellings as my boss. She was the domestic policy advisor in the White House, and then she was the secretary of education. Uh, but the relationship is like, I mean, you are knitted together all the time because the policy staff in the White House is pretty small. Obviously, the agency is the one really implementing all of the policy and programs at the federal level. So, so the team in the White House is, is um, small in relation to like what you have down the street at the Department of Education. So number one, you were constantly working together. I mean, it wasn't the kind of thing where once a week or twice a week, you were on the phone with the Department of Education. It was every single day. It was often multiple times a day. Um, and so it's very close. The thing, and I can talk more about this, but I wanna let the, the others answer too. The thing that can be really interesting is sort of, you know, depending on what the app, the president's priorities are within a given period of time, more of the focus might be coming from the White House versus the agency or vice versa. I had the, um, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of serving for President Bush and I came into the administration in 2002. So I had been on Capitol Hill and worked on passage of No Child Left Behind. And then I showed up in the administration six months later, which was a whole new level of work to then think about all the regulations and implementation of that law over the coming seven years that I got to work on. And so that was done so tightly and jointly between the White House and the Department of Education that it was, it was fairly seamless. And because it was such a big issue for President Bush, um, we had a pretty significant role in the White House. A lot of what we did too, your job in the White House is policy, it's budget, um, but it's also thinking about like events and the exposure and when do we need to be out publicly, you know, addressing issues and getting the president out. So it was a really varying role. I, uh, so thank you so much for having us. Glad to be here and thanks to all of you for your service. Um, I'm sure many of you did not sign up to be State Board of Education members during a pandemic in the past year we've been through for kids. So extra extra thanks for, for sticking with it. Um, I agree with everything Holly said. Uh, we, I, I hear this is not always true, but I will say in the Obama administration, the White House and the Department of Education had a really um, high touch, high functioning relationship. We had uh, all worked together very well. Um, I will say like Holly, I went to the department off the hill and was shocked by how much work it took to implement and the level of regulations and guidance and legal analysis and words on paper it took. And um, I always thought of the White House as sort of being in between Capitol Hill and the agency in terms of sort of how far into the details you have to get. 
the, the, and that to me is the one other thing I'd add to what Holly said, which is, I mean, she sort of, if you're at the White House, you have to work on all the things. In the depart in the Obama administration, there were, I think, max three to four people in the White House working on education, and there were, depending how you count them, four thousand people at the Department of Education working on education, which means there are only a few things where the White House folks can really lean into the details. And even there, it's at a far higher level, whereas at the agency, there's people in the details on everything. So you sort of got, you know, it, it, I think it matters as someone on the outside thinking about where you advocate to, because the White House can focus on this many of the things, and that's it. The other 90% of things, they're not able to fully focus on if they're not rising to that level of presidential priority, or frankly, the level of something going wrong that um, they're focused on. And so a lot of the other times sort of like, the place to be and the place to focus has to be at the agency because they're the only ones paying attention to a set of the work. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I'd add. So it's a great question. I don't have a lot to add to what's what's been said. Those, I mean, I, I I agree with all that. I would add, uh, start saying my colleague said, but you can't say enough. Thank you for your service. Uh, being a state board member, it's a, it's a lot of time and work at a normal time. And this is obviously not a normal uh, not a normal time. And state boards, I really think sincerely are one of the most under leveraged parts of the education system. There's so much that they can do and so many opportunities there. And so thank you for, for being uh, in those seats. Um, there's a couple of quick things I guess I would add. Um, uh, there is a natural friction between the White House and agencies, um, uh, and it can be more or less pronounced. It'll probably be less pronounced uh, in the, at least in the early going of the Biden administration, just given uh, the amount of, the, of White House personnel working on the issue, um, Secretary Cardona, and then who I know you all, you all heard from yesterday, and like, you know, the First Lady has an interest. It'll probably be more seamless. But there are times when with different agencies, and you may see that in the Biden administration and with education in the past, where there's been a little bit more, there's been a little bit more friction. And that's a, that's a normal thing. I mean, historically, agencies in the White House butt heads on different, on different things. One thing that's changed since Clinton uh, to now is just the increasing use of what we call sort of, you know, pen and phone policymaking. I mean, sort of guidance letters and so forth were pretty, either pretty unusual or pretty, you know, pretty non-controversial stuff. And now that like policy is being made like that, that has stitched the White House and the agencies together a little bit more uh, closely and a little less of that alignment with with Congress because Congress is getting gets cut out of the equation. Um, and then the other piece of the White House, there's an agency that doesn't get a lot of attention. And when it does, it tends to be stuff like so near attendance nomination um, to, to head OMB. Suddenly everybody started talking about OMB and then OMB is already sort of faded back out of the news. Is an enormously important agency? Um, uh, you know, both um, Emma and Holly talked about all the regulations and so forth you deal with. Those are promulgated ultimately out of out of OMB. It's an important the management function. It's not just the office of budget. It's the office of management and budget. Management comes first, and it's an enormously important agency. And one of the things the White House staff often ends up doing is running interference between agencies and OMB on on various things. And the reason I mention, I'm always just struck. Like everybody's very interested in all these other roles. Um, nobody ever talks about who the, who the pads are going to be at OMB, the associate directors, their background, and so forth. And that just plays an enormous role in the policymaking that people on state boards uh, are going to are going to live. And it's just one of those things that like, you know, it's sort of an open secret in Washington. You just don't hear about in a lot of other places. So that's the other agency I would just pay a fair amount of, of attention to, especially especially now. Thanks, some really great perspectives there. And Andy, something you said that you started the, your comments there was that you feel that state boards are some of the most underutilized or under uh, effective uh, means of effective uh, leadership and policy making here. Um, of course, we used to see the uh, at the federal level, we thought the federal level was the nexus for policy making in education, but uh, so much of that has now been devolved back to the states, either through ESSA or now leading the pandemic recovery. What would be your advice to a state board of education member if they want to advocate for their needs at the federal level? Um, what, how can they best leverage their voice so that, they're, that, that, that those things happen in Washington that they need to happen or want to happen based upon their state? So some advice there. And I'll just, I'm just gonna leave this open mic that whoever wants to answer, jump in, and then everybody else can answer. 
Well, I'll go to Emma and Andy. I'll go first because I'm unmuted. But next time somebody else needs to go first. Um, um, a couple kind of very practical, tactical things that I'm going to say here. Number one is, uh, you know, the, the department has kind of a communications and external affairs office. And that's the place who really manages all the relationships, as you know, Robert, with all of the associations and the groups, et cetera. So number one, I mean, there are people there whose job it is every single day um, to be talking to you all and getting input and relaying it to their colleagues. So always, always do that. The second thing is the staff, um, especially for your states, as you're thinking about everything from accountability plans to Title I funding to like the, the big programmatic pieces that come through ESSA and, you know, um, it comes through the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. And there's also a team there who really works with every state on accountability plans and what do those look like and what gets approved by the department. Um, the, the chief state school officer is the one who's most on the front lines in terms of those conversations with that office. But as much as you all, when you have differences of opinion with your chief state school officer, obviously, you know, you need to find you need to find ways to convey your own opinions as state board members. But when you are in line with your chief state school officer, you also need to make sure to really leverage that relationship and those conversations that happen all the time between chiefs and that office of elementary and secondary ed education who are working day to day on all of these kind of implementation and accountability and funding issues that are such a core of that relationship between states and the federal government. I, oh, go, Andy, you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Emma. Um, yeah, so I'll say when I was chief of staff, I heard from state chiefs all the time, every day, more than I wanted to, um, and probably heard from a countable number of state board members, like Countable on one hand, number of state board members. That doesn't mean you should be going to the chief of staff, but like it just goes to Holly's point of how frequently, don't don't do that. In fact, it's probably bad advice. How frequently they're engaging. I would say, first thing is, the Department of Education or the White House do not want to engage in intrastate squabbles, right? So it's not just what Holly said about using your state chief, but like you want to be in the same place as others in your state as much as possible and make that very clear, right? We don't want to litigate between the state board and the chief, between the governor and the board, between the advocates and the chief, like that's not appropriate. Um, and so the more you can be aligned and have a united front, as well as, as Holly said, use the relationships that others have, the better. And I would say that is the chief, that is your, your governor, whose calls, you know, whether it's the governor or the governor's ed policy staff, the department gets a lot of calls from those folks as well. Um, I would say that's your key leading advocates, particularly if they're ones the agency might care about. The last thing I'd say is it's your members of Congress, right? Be, uh, that's, that's part of the department's accountability mechanism is being responsive to, to Congress who funds us and oversees all our policies. And so where you really feel like you're not being heard or think your members of Congress would be aligned, um, reaching out to their staff and using that to get to the administration can be helpful too. And people, many of you have, I'm sure, done this because people do do this a lot. Like we would get calls from members of Congress who are trying to back up their state chief or state board members on particular issues of concern. Um, the only other thing I would say is, um, again, super tactical because I assume this is helpful, like just be really concrete about what the problem is, right? You don't need to be an expert in federal law. You're not supposed to be, but being able to really point at what's the barrier or what's the opportunity or the thing that's trying to get in your way is just incredibly helpful to the department having a shot at being able to address it in the right ways, assuming they want to. Yeah, that's all excellent advice. I would start on that last one. Like we would get requests and you'd be like, you can do this. Like they would come and there'd be a big push and all this. And you'd be like, you you can like do this right now. You have, you have the authority. So like, that's a big one. Understand the policy context, the policy. What are the actual barriers? There is just a cultural issue in education. And I think it's because there are an awful lot of regulations, obviously, um, that then people tend to assume even more, um, uh, even more barriers than there are. And you often hear, we can't do this because of FERPA. And like you look and it's actually, that's not actually a FERPA issue. 
Um, so yeah, I would, the big piece of advice there, picking up on, on Emma's last one would be do your homework. Um, come with solutions. Uh, I think it, it, I'm often struck how often people come with a pain point, but there's no, there's, there's no solution. Um, come, come with solutions and ideas. And then third, and this kind of goes um, to something Emma said, but I'll pick up on like, look, the system is designed to stop things, right? That's how government is designed, is for things not to happen. That's by design. I don't say that like, that's, I'm not being glib or I'm being dead serious. Like that's the way the system is set up is to make it hard to get things done. That was the founder's intent. Um, that then morphs out to just a culture. It is hard to get stuff done in Washington. You have to get lots of different um, institutions to align that is hard to do. And so another thing you can do is figure out, like in addition to Emma's advice about like line everybody up, also figure out who's gonna be against this? What is the informal ecosystem that exists? Who, who, who are they gonna call and be like, do you think this is a good idea or a bad idea? Um, that's different interest groups, that's different individuals. Um, figure out who those people are and try to make your best case to them. Um, so for example, let's say you want to do something that flirts around sort of equity and accountability. If you can get a group like the Ed Trust to bless it or some other civil rights groups, it's going to go down a lot easier because that's the first people who are going to get a call. Like, is this going to be good or bad from an equity standpoint? And so if you've done that education work, and I often find like stuff sometimes dies, not because it's a terrible idea, but just it dies because that sort of work hasn't been done. And I don't, I don't know what the right word is. Maybe Emma, I see her nodding her head. Maybe she's where it's like, it's like, it just sort of dies of like natural attrition rather than like getting killed off because it's not a good idea. Um, and so that sort of pre-wiring um, is good. And also you're going to find people are going to be like, no, I don't think this is a good idea. Um, and so you stress test your idea. You find out where people are. And sometimes your idea is going to get better because people are going to be like, I don't think it's a good idea, but if you change these two aspects of it, that's something I could totally support. Um, and so I feel like that work in that sort of, I don't know what you call it. It's not just, it's not just lobbyists or advocacy groups. It's that sort of ecosystem that exists around policy is really important. One of the things that you said, Andy, was that um, perceived policy, I'm starting to using a term with state boards that you have phantom policies, policies that you think exist, that think you, you that really aren't there. So I think that that's some great advice. No, you do have the power to do a lot of things that uh, you may think that you do not have what to do. So I'd be interested, Robert, I, Holly or Emma may disagree, but I think like the story of federal policy has been, everybody thinks it's been this gigantic power grab, but really like since Clinton through, you know, so starting No Child Behind on, it's really been a devolution of power to the states and then pulling up from school districts. They definitely have lost some authority around certain things, but states are like, you know, that's where the action is. And so there's all this, you know, the, the Washington knows best rhetoric. That's if you're running for office, it makes sense to say that, um, uh, particularly if you're on Holly's side of the aisle to sort of attack on that stuff. But really most of this stuff is actually state purview now and states, they have a lot of latitude. Yeah, that's the point we like to hear. <laughs> well, and I, I just wanna echo something Andy said, which he said, come with solutions or if you don't exact have the exact solution, have an idea, right? Because I think one of the one of the things I always remember was the states that we had the best relationships with were the ones who said, okay, we're having a hard time with this. Here's what we would like to do. How can we make this work? Right. And we'd figure it out. The ones where we had the worst relationships were the ones that came to you and knew that the law said X and that the department had a, you know, had a responsibility to implement the law, but wanted to get out of everything. And so it was like, well, well, what are, let's try and figure out what are you, are we at least aligned on what we're trying to achieve? If you have a different way to do it, come and tell us what it is and let's talk about it and figure out if we can make it work. But the harder relationships with states were the ones where it was like, you know, it was just a lot of like, we don't want to be part of that. And it was like, well, we, the, the, the department doesn't have the option to just not implement the law. They've got other pressures, right, from Congress who's saying, please go implement it. We pass this. So, so that's where kind of keeping in mind, like, what does that look like? And coming with it, at least a little bit of a, like, we're committed to making this work, but we might need a little bit of flexibility. Can you help us? Yeah, all really good points there. Um, we said the topic of our conversation was really post-pandemic, moving forward, and while we've, we've done some really good uh, level setting here, but let's delve now into some particular issues, and I'm going to uh, ask individual panelists some questions. So, Emma, I want to start with you, that 
Um, you wrote a piece uh, for Talking Points Memo that delved into a topic um, that's really on the top of mind for state board members, and that's a diverse and inclusive government, the value of hearing different perspectives and uh, from families, educators, community groups, and so forth. And we did some of that yesterday, and we're encouraging boards to you know, hear all those various perspectives. So my question for you is, how do you see the Biden administration's goal of a diverse and inclusive government also shaping and changing state government? I appreciate that question because it is what we are trying to do at Next 100. Um, so just the 15 second, because it'll give a lot of context on that. So Next 100, as you heard, is a startup think tank for the next generation of policy leaders. But what that really means is that we are about trying to think about how we build a more inclusive policy making system and process. So that's both about how do we knock down the barriers to get people with more lived experience, more proximity to communities, more diversity into government roles and um, policy agenda setting roles. So how do we actually shift the talent pipeline? So we have different people at the table making these decisions because there are so many barriers to that table um, that are not necessarily related to being able to shape policy well. And then two is how do we actually think about doing policy differently? How do we get folks like the Department of Education to do what you did yesterday, which is engage with families and educators and students in a way that's meaningful. It's not, I checked the box, I did the thing my state plan said I had to do, I had a round table. It's not, I'm rolling out this new agenda, please stand with me at the press conference, but it's actually from soup to nuts, from setting priorities to implementing them, to having accountability for them. How are you including impacted communities at the table, which for many of us as families, educators, and students. So that is sort of what we are trying to do broadly obviously where different states are here like i cannot speak to every state but but i would say i think um that biden administration trying to lean into both of those areas to me feels like a really important place for state governments to be thinking through right like who are the senior people in your state government on the board staffing the board in your state educational agency how do they get there what experience do they bring how regularly are they talking to um families of color in a meaningful way to students experiencing homelessness what was their path and how can we make that pathway broader right how can we i mean i am i am a i am a career bureaucrat i'm all good with it but how can we make sure we're opening the doors to a lot of different types of people which is often about knocking down the like frankly elitism and credential barriers that get in the way of people getting these jobs and providing professional development to people who want to go work in government and policy the way we think we provide it to we provide it to educators right so that's one thing and i think like i don't think there's a state government in the country that couldn't do more to think about how they're supporting and building a more inclusive and diverse staff but then the second thing is and i think there's a great role for state boards here is what are you actually asking your state agency to do in terms of how it does outreach to and feedback to uh, students and families every step of the way, right? Again, not at the end, not to check off what you have to do for ESSA. Yeah, you got to do it for ESSA. But how do you actually do it in a way that helps you set priorities, helps you implement those priorities, and helps you circle back and create transparency um, to people whose job, it, it's not their job to become policy experts. It's their job to experience the system and know how you're doing and serving them. And I think uh, pushing your state agency on the formal systems and processes they're doing to do that along the way is, I think, really important. And I think we could we could all go down a long path about the many things we've learned from this pandemic. And I, I think it's really critical. And I think we've learned a lot. But when you look at the data across the country of uh, what it looks like for families of color to be sending their kids back to school and how much they systematically are not, even as schools are reopening and the lack of trust, I'm in New York, the lack of trust that shows by families and kids in the system. For my job, we're having some conversations with students this week. And like, I hope one of the things we'll take from this moment is we have to build a system where, where families trust. And there is a 0% chance of us doing that if we don't do a better job of engaging them through the way, and if they don't see people like them leading the system. And I think that's critical. Great, now just a note to our members, be sure that you're, as you're if you, I have a whole host of questions. I could go for three hours here, but if you have questions, make sure you put them in the chat box because I may not be asking the questions that you want to be asked or 
I want the conversation to go. So feel free to jump in here. So Holly, I want to turn now to you that um, one of the key tenets of the Bush administration and the work of uh, the Bush Library is using data to measure and to monitor progress to a clear set of goals. As you know, there's a whole lot of conversation about measuring student learning right now to gauge, you know, um, just how we need to accelerate the recovery or whatnot for students. So can you talk for just a minute about what your advice would be to states as uh, they hear concerned about administering assessments in the spring? Yeah. They hear, they hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and this is obviously an issue that comes up every year and the pandemic has just made this like a ripe topic of conversation. And I will say this, there have been people for decades who don't like assessments and, and in a time like COVID, they are ramping up their opposition to assessments, right? So it's not like a newfound concern. There are some people who've always been opposed to assessments and continue to be opposed to assessments. So then there's just a general concern about like, how do you do it, right? In a year that looks like this school year. Um, so, I, you know, I'm a fan of data and assessments, as you know, it was a big part of No Child Left Behind. As you mentioned, it's a big part of what we still think because, and, and part of the reason I think people have to get creative this year is because of all of the studies and, and um, that have come back, which show that, you know, there's learning loss, which is not surprising. We all suspected it was going to happen and sure enough, it's happening. And we're going to have to figure out how to pretty quickly accelerate making up the gaps that are showing up this school year. Now, to the point, to the conversation we were having earlier, this is going to require some level of like flexibility and creativity on behalf of states with the assessment companies to figure out how to do this. But this is where it's sort of a willingness to have a we're going to we're going to make the best of this. We're not going to be perfect, but like figure out how to do as much as possible to get the right data and information and some level of comparable data and information, which which I think is very important. It can't just be school level data. We've got to have some look at comparable data across districts and across the state is something that is a real task. Of, but, but part of it's like the, the um, energy and sort of uh, point of view you bring to that and knowing, and this is where I think the department has generally indicated this, like we want people to continue assessments. We're willing to have conversations with you about how to do that because we know in a time like this, it requires creativity, um, but setting that expectation that we're not just gonna completely take it off the table and have two years with no state level annual assessment data is also not a great option for people like state boards to understand where you are, for teachers to understand and principals and, and superintendents and parents to understand where their kids are. Anybody else want to weigh in on that before I move it forward? I know that's a hot topic. So, if not, I think I'll, I'll just say I, I rather than get the substance of it, it kind of reinforces something we talked about earlier that this whole issue of what assessment should look like in the spring, like that was not a debate that was simply happening inside the Biden administration with a couple of policy people. That whole ecosystem of people who were involved, and that was it's actually I find kind of remarkable that there hasn't been like a good reported story on sort of the TikTok and the timeline of that because it's a great sort of story of how things evolve in Washington and how that policy came together um uh that was that whole ecosystem getting involved and so forth and that's so that's just an example of, I mean there's all kinds of groups and advocates on on all different sides of it um and it was it was a very sort of fluid situation and that's that's that it's a really just good example um uh it's just a good example of that issue well, Andy, I want to stay then with you as we kind of, I, don't, I hate the popcorn topics, but if we get through a lot of this, we just need to kind of do that. But I want to uh, stay with you and um, talk a little bit about the report that Bellwether released, um, Missing in the Margins, that highlighted the 3 million students um, for whom last March might have been the last time they experienced any type of formal education. That's really just a devastating number. And can you help us as board members unpack this and what state leaders should be doing to uh, in as a result of that? Yeah, I mean, 
I don't even know where to start. We've been um, concerned last spring. We took a look at the number of kids who when schools closed in March, they were sent home and didn't get any other learning. And, you know, it, it was a hard it was a hard, unpredictable situation for sure, but there was a tendency to focus. It was great that you had teachers who were, you know, showing up on students' lawns with whiteboards and teaching. And, you know, one of my kids' teachers started a book club. And there was a lot of really inspiring stuff going on. But there was also a lot of kids who got sent home with just packets, and particularly in rural areas where there wasn't good broadband access. Um, in urban areas, you had kids who were disconnected for different reasons. And in the suburbs where everybody sort of naturally assumes everything's fine in the suburbs, there was a lot of kids who were getting lost. That was like at least six to seven million kids. Um, this fall, we came out with this missing in the margins report at Bellwether. We're a sort of a, we're not, we're kind of a weird, we're, I'm probably this is probably in good marketing, starting with weird. We're kind of a quirky, um, a uh, quirky nonprofit uh, consulting organization. We do we do work across a, a range of issues, but one of them is um, disconnected kids. So these are kids who are system involved, juvenile justice, foster, homeless, things like that, and and sort of how disconnected the policy environment they have to navigate is, and how we can create a more seamless system for them. Um, and so we were particularly interested in this group of kids, with got us looking at this data. And yeah, we found you know more than three million kids. Just no one knows where they are, and that's I mean. From where I sit, that's a catastrophe. That should be on the front page um, every day. I mean, you just think, I mean, three million kids, right? And these were disproportionately, by the way, kids who are already along, you know, a distance from opportunity. These were not kids who the system was working for and they were necessarily thriving pre-pandemic. Um, and so our concern has been, this is a challenge I mean, I think you had to give people a lot of grace in March, April of 2020 school systems. I mean, you remember people like it's easy to forget it's been a year and vaccinations and things back then, like everybody was like washing their grocery bags, right? Like there was lots we didn't know. It was a very weird, um, but it's a year later and it is unclear we've had sort of the urgency we need and the agility to meet every kid where they are um, and to find all these kids. And um a lot of this is like real basic blocking and tackling, going out, figuring out where kids are, what they need to get re reconnected. I mean, these, this is not 3 million kids in one place. This is 3 million kids scattered around the country. Um, and so it, it, gets, it gets more bite-sized when you get community by community. And I think it's, there's a question we have to ask ourselves um, in the public school world is like, have we had the agility you really need to respond to this? And we're still seeing it. I mean, I think there's a, there's a case to be made that the way we're sort of doing kind of hybrid learning and concurrent learning at the same time, that it's, it's, it's ending up not being a great experience for kids, whether they're in school or not in school, rather than like, we're gonna deliver really good online for people who want that, we're gonna deliver really good in person for people who want that. And so I think it points up this larger issue that state boards do need to think about, which is this issue of agility and sort of urgency of response and so forth, because, you know, and we're not gonna be out of the woods in the fall. I think everyone's hoping, you know, obviously we don't have variants or a third way, but even, like if you look at the number of kids who have left the system and are back yet, um, possibility of further outbreaks, the, what, the realistic schedule for getting kids vaccinated, this is going to be disruptive for some period of time. And I think you know at some point we need to have some hard conversations about the the response and has it sort of had that sort of level again of urgency and agility that um, it really should because there's I think a lot of kids um, who really need um, uh, who really need something different than what they're getting right now. Yeah, that we've discussed now a couple of the real big issues that we that state boards are facing as they, you know, try to recover and try to move beyond the pandemic. Uh, so let's focus now a little bit on some solutions, perhaps, and, and what to, uh, how these problems can be attacked. And um, to quote President Biden, that help is on the way. That uh, signed into law just a few weeks ago was the 1.9 trillion recovery that's significant funding to states. I mean, just really significant. And this is really a once in you know, a lifetime opportunity to, to take care of not only the, some issues that are pandemic related, but some of the issues that prep led into the pandemic that were existing long before we had a pandemic. So it's a real opportunity for, uh, uh, for states and state boards here. So Holly, I wanna ask you, how can states use this, um, money from the American Rescue uh, Plan to boost innovation and better support students. Are there uh, key findings from your work at the Bush Institute that uh, 
uh, states should learn to uh, learn from and how to invest their funds most wisely. What advice would you have if you were sitting in their chairs and had this opportunity? Yeah, well, a couple of things that I would, to me, that I would keep in mind. Um, number one is kind of, you know, the short-term issues of getting schools reopened to kids. I mean, all of the sort of things that you need to be able to do that is to me, priority number one. Um, equally as important in the very short term is thinking about this issue of learning loss and how do you sort of put in place the right innovations and supports and I think school like states should be real willing to try a whole bunch of things that maybe wasn't what how they did it before, right? Um, uh, so those are the two kind of immediate short term issues that I think every state and every district has to focus on. I do think people should keep in mind over the I would say in a three to five year horizon. What may be some things that we don't want to look with that we want to kind of open ourselves up to that we might have learned from from this school year. Um, and one of the things that I've kind of long thought and I thought this pre COVID and I especially think this now is. Uh, but it's not something you know you kind of redo overnight is the way we structure our school day and school year it looks exactly the same as it did decades ago and we know kids and families needs are very different. Um, and so I'd, I'd sort of have a little bit of a vision for like, where do we want this to go over a couple of years, even if you haven't necessarily thought, okay, exactly how am I going to get there? Um, and then the last thing I would just say, because of the, this is a staggering amount of money um, that, that's going out the door. And everybody should be real aware that they should be very transparent about how they're spending it. There are going to be a lot of eyes on how people are spending it and a lot of people wanting to understand how it's being spent. So just be thoughtful about that and be aware and be willing to be transparent with your states about where it's going and how you're spending it and what you're learning from it. Now, while I threw that question to Holly, I'd love to hear the same, the same question from Andy and Anna. I mean, you're a big spender. Why don't you go first and then? I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> I think so. I I would I would I agree with a lot of what Holly said. So apologies if I end up being a little redundant. I guess that's a, a few different things. I think. Um, when we, for folks who are around or on their state board or somewhere else in the ecosystem in 2009, we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act or ARA, which was the last time there was not this large an investment of federal funds in education, um, but a fairly large investment of federal uh, additional funds in educational systems. Um, and the money looked similar in a lot of ways in terms of how it flowed out the door. Um, and look different in one in one key way, which was that there were some baseline requirements that states basically had to meet to get the money. And not everybody was happy about that, right? There was a, we're in a moment of crisis, don't tell us to fix our data systems right now. We're in a moment of crisis, don't tell us to raise our standards right now, um, which were a couple of the sort of things. And, and I think there was some sympathy for that, but I also think in retrospect, um, it's really important at these moments of crisis that you don't, not just don't return to the status quo, but that you're really thoughtful in pushing about what that means in terms of system level reform, right? Like this is a what probably, hopefully, once in a lifetime infusion of new dollars. A lot of those are going to need to go just to reopening schools, as Holly said, and a lot are going to need to know, go to academic acceleration. I mean, we're also dancing, like, We've never done this as a country. The idea, the amount of academic acceleration we're going to need to do with the evidence base we have about a few strategies that have been highly effective in pretty small contexts, such as high dosage tutoring, which has a very good evidence base, but has not been done at the scale of America. Um, we have a lot, we have a lot to do and a lot to figure out. And so I think a lot of this money needs to go to reopening schools. A lot of it needs to go to the evidence-based strategies and they're going to be scaled more quickly than they're ready to be scaled and they're not all going to show the same results and and I think it is actually a key state board and state responsibility to think about how to maximize the results for the kids who are furthest behind frankly and how do you focus the most on funding implementation and support to the districts and schools serving the kids who have been left furthest behind by the 
system in the pandemic. So there's gonna to need to be a lot of focus there. But I also think thinking through what are the systems level changes we should make at this moment in time, the equivalent of higher standards, the equivalent of data systems during ARA. I think, I think Holly tagged a few of them and I think they should be things that come out of our learnings from the pandemic and our learnings from finally having a sort of more honest conversation about racial injustice in this country. But like, what, who is the system set up to serve? Why was it so hard to get everybody online, as Andy said? Why was it so hard to get everybody hardware? Like, that should never happen again, right? As Andy said, we have a very non-resilient educational system, not just educational system, everything system. But how can we use this moment and some of these dollars to be more resilient the next time something happens? Because the same things that make our systems more resilient in a moment of crisis will make us more responsive to families with different needs, to families and kids with the greatest needs. And so I, I think that'll look different in different states, but what are the um, longer term investments you can be making so that we can minimize, maximize equity in this moment and then sort of mi minimize further disruptions for our, our kids. And the last thing I'd say, cause I said it implicitly and not explicitly is just like, um, how do you have a focus on equity with every single thing you are doing, right? And I think, um, how are your supposedly neutral decisions not um, not making equity worse, right? And I will pick on one thing because I think it's a really good example that that Congress tried to adjust, but that will just spend a lot on state action. After ARA and states cut funding, we saw what actually happened was in a lot of places states disproportionately cut funding to the highest need schools. In many cases, they didn't mean to do that, right? If you have a progressive state funding formula and you cut it across the board, your highest need kids in schools see the biggest cut. That's not a good outcome in a moment of crisis. Congress tried to adjust for that this time and has basically told states and districts, you can't do that. You can't disproportionately cut funds for low income schools or uh, kids or districts, and that's good. But how are you doing more than that, right? Whether it's in terms of where your dollars are going or where your deepest support for implementation around high dosage tutoring is going. How are you really leaning in, like in, or, or how you're thinking, as Andy said, the kids who were always left behind and are falling through the cracks again, right? Students experiencing homelessness, students with disabilities, multilingual learners, all of whom we didn't set up the best systems to serve them in the pandemic, and now need to figure out how to resolve that. I'll just pick up real briefly, that was great, where Emma left off, which is um, the fiscal equity issue here. This is 120 billion plus, and that's on top of two earlier uh, tranches of, of money. There's more money that states can actually put towards education. We can talk about that in a sec. Um, if we don't have something to show for it on the other side, I think it will set back the effort of fiscal equity uh, and as, as you know, I think as everyone on this call knows, for a variety of reasons, historical, racial, class, our school finance systems in a lot of states don't work well. Emma just talked about one example of how that can play out. If we don't have something, though, to show for this money on the other side of it, I think it'll set back efforts to address that for decades, because the narrative politically will be, we spent all this money and like it just the system just absorbed it like a sponge or it bounced off. And couple that with like, Politics is a pendulum uh, and, and it will change and there could be a reaction to some of the politics for today. I think there's I think there's more risk here. Um, it seems like it, it seems like we're sort of heading into the roaring 20s again. But in terms of like school finance, I think there's actually more risk here um, uh, than we're perhaps perceiving. Um, the biggest thing you can do with this money is plan. I think there's this tenet, we've got to get it, we've got to get it. The, the timelines to obligate it are long. You can be obligating this money into 2023. Once you start to get the money, it needs to flow down to districts very fast. And so there's, there's an opportunity for state leaders to hit pause and plan. And I think there's two things that a little bit work against each other. Nobody wants to take on obligations and sort of build in an overhang with this money, which obviously that makes good fiscal sense. But that can lead to a tendency of sort of how do we just spend it on a bunch of one-time stuff, which could reinforce the problem I was talking about earlier. We don't really have a lot to show for it. Um, on the on the other side, and you couple that with most states. Thankfully, the fiscal outlook is not nearly as bleak as we thought it was going to be. You know, a year ago and all that. Um, it's it's a little more acute in some lo local places. There are some states, but in general, things are things are better than much better than we thought it was going to be. 
there's an opportunity to stop and plan, use evidence, um, like not just do tutoring, but like, as Emma said, like do high dosage tutoring aligned with the fidelity to the way the research says you should do it to be effective, not sort of spread around like peanut butter, which is how we often do this stuff. And so I really think that is just enormously important. Um, and it's just going to require a lot of state leadership just to pause and think, how do we use this as creatively as possible to leverage as much as possible, not just sort of get it and spread it around? Because I do think the political cost for that, a 20% increase you know, plus over the last year, I, I think the political cost for that, if we don't have some really compelling examples, could could be high. I couldn't agree more. Those are some excellent points, Andy. We we often use the term with state boards that you have about legacy leadership. What is your legacy going to be 10 years from now? And you don't want your legacy to be the one that you messed this up. You know, what has been your, what is the legacy with, with the with resources you've been given? I want to hop now to a question that's in a has come in from one of our states in the chat box from Indiana. It says Pres President Biden's agenda calls for new strategies in human capital investment. How do you ensure that we have the diverse, prepared, and highly effective educators and leaders necessary for all students? Any reaction to that? I see Holly, you're unmuted. I know, but I actually want my colleagues to answer this first. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have okay. a good perspective on this. All righty, all righty. I want to hear their perspectives. So I'll get out of the way. I just think when we talk about like ideas, what could you pause and plan for? If you seriously want to diversify your teaching force, you have an enormous opportunity in front of you with like a number of factors that are sort of lining up um, that give you an opportunity to do that. That's the kind of thing if a state decided to prioritize that, you have an incredible opportunity in front of you to do that. Um, but only if you pause and plan and think creatively about it, not if you just sort of, you know, spray and pray with the money and hope that you put it out there and that's a priority and you hope people do it. That's not, you're not going to get it if you, yeah. but if you're deliberate, but I, I really want to hear what my colleagues have to say. I'll just add, let me just add this. And it, I agree with Andy. It, that is a systems level issue that you don't just solve overnight. Um, on the other hand, it's a really important one. And it's often the things that sort of get left off the table because it's, you've got to be long-term in terms of your thinking about it. When it, one of the things we have done here at the Bush Institute is we've done a lot of work around school leadership and how do you develop better pipelines for school leaders, um, including, you know, working with teachers who eventually want to move into uh, the principalship. And a lot of what we've done with the school districts, especially this past year during COVID, is work with them to figure out how to walk and chew gum at the same time. Because and they've been able, I give them lots of credit for, for figuring out how to keep that work from a systems and pipeline level in place at the same time that they're attending to the immediate needs of their kids. But, um, you know, if thinking about this issue of, of the teaching force and how you sort of develop better candidates, diverse candidates is really important and requires a commitment and some goal setting and some real like commitment to, to having this be a long-term proposition at the state level and at the district level. Yeah. Um, Holly, I'm so glad you said this, because to me, this is exactly the example in Andy of like what you could choose to make a systems level priority at this moment in time when there is actually uh, all the, a lot of the things you'd want to do in this space will cost money up front, but there is additional money that is, that is, could go into something that's good for kids. I would add a few things. Um, First of all, I know this sounds really, really silly, but like, what data do you currently have? There are so many states and districts that either don't know the real diversity of their workforce, or if they do, they don't know the retention and turnover rates by race, right? And that's a lot of what we need to be focusing on, not just who do we bring in, but who stays, yeah. and then who stays and becomes a leader, mm -hmm. because leaders of color are more likely to build and retain diverse uh, teachers of color in their schools, right? And so like, first of all, do you at the state level and do your districts have the data about what your workforce looks like um, and what it looks like over time and who's staying. Um, and it costs money to collect that data if you don't have it and to make it transparent. And so I think that is that is one thing I'd say. Second thing I'd say, Liz, just like, what are the real pathways in your state? Where are your candidates coming from? Are you doing, I mean, this is the equivalent of what we're doing at Next 100. Where, where are you going to find teacher candidates? Are you pulling from the communities your schools are in? Are you, you know, there's early exposure high school programs that are really interesting in a number of places that are starting to look at how do you get high school students engaged in teaching with a path through their um, local public college 
to come back and teach within their system, right? So what are the pathways you're creating from for people in the community to serve and teach in their community as opposed to recruiting everywhere and plopping people in? And then the third thing I say is this a little, but like I do think the retention and culture point is really important. Like we talk a lot about how do we bring uh, a diverse cohort of teachers in, but how do we keep them? Like in New York City, we're not doing well enough at bringing them in, but we're also losing them at disproportionate rates, right? And that's about the culture you're building in a school. It's about the same things in every other type of organization, right? Who's, em who's empowered? Who's listened to? What's the culture you're building that's actually inclusive for everybody? And how are you supporting people? So I think that's the last thing I'd say. Um, the final thing I'd say, just because it goes to my point four, is at this moment of crisis, I said, where are your supposedly neutral decisions actually having a disproportionate impact? Right. And one of the things we know from ARA a bit um, is uh, often teacher layoffs that are supposedly neutral disproportionately impact teachers of color because a lot of people have done good work to diversify their educator workforce over the past 5, 10, 20 years. But when your most, uh, when your newest teachers are the most likely to be laid off, you are you are obviously moving backwards in your diversity goals. So it's just a really good example of how these supposedly neutral decisions in times of crisis can actually move you away from your stated racial equity goal that we have seen happen time and again. Well, all of the things that you've talked about in terms of the, uh, the workforce, all those things live within a policy ecosystem that govern those things. And almost every decision around that, that ecosystem falls at the state board table. Because in almost every state, teacher licensure falls at the, at the state board table. The approval of the accreditation of, of universities and the, the programs, approving the programs of study for teachers, falls at the board table. So there's really no reason for state boards not to take ownership of this piece because they, the power does fall there at the board table in most states. So I'm just, we're, we're almost completely out of time. And I'm going to throw just one last question, and we'll end on this one before we segue into our next uh, into our next uh, session. But really quickly, and just I'd like all of you to answer this question um, in our last two minutes: Is that what have you seen during the pandemic that gives you hope that this crisis may catapult to a stronger education system? What gives you hope out of this? Hoping there is some hope here. <laughs> Who wants to be first? Well, I'll go. Number one, I mean, you know, there are so many, uh, there are so many examples and stories we've heard and seen, and people we know, um, where I especially, I think I'm especially heartened by the teachers and administrators at the local level who have just done their darndest to sort of figure out how to reach kids that have been hard to reach during the pandemic. I mean, Andy talked about the millions of kids who've, who've sort of, you know, fallen out of the scene. But there have also been these amazing examples and stories of people who are sort of using more innovative ways, sometimes just using really simple ways to like go find kids and families. And the thing that I also generally think is a good thing overall is this focus on like the, fam the family themselves is an important perspective that we too often just don't take it into account enough. And I mean, families have learned a lot about schools and parents who've been doing virtual learning at home, but just sort of like how we're attending to the needs of families, especially for our neediest kids, I think is a bit of, a, a, of an opening for us to just make sure we keep that front and center going forward. Emma or Andy? I'll, I'll go, I mean, you're still muted. Um, I think like, as Holly said, across education, you saw like inspiring examples of, and that's, you know, teachers doing extraordinary things. That's parents who figured out how to create little makeshift schools in their garages or co-oping with their neighbors and kind of becoming homeschoolers. You saw just a lot of stuff and you saw it across sort of all lines of race and class and sort of all the things that, that usually divide us. And you didn't just see it on education. You saw that like just in general, like Americans tried to do things. You saw, you know, volunteer efforts and efforts around, you know, the hungry and so forth. And just stuff you, you saw coming together. I think the failure, and this may not get me 
invited back. Um, I think the failures was our leaders and continues to be. So essentially, like we, we had, there was people who were resilient and we expected kids and families to be resilient. But as, as my colleagues, as both Holly and Emma said, the system is not resilient. And I think we saw that again and again, and that is in no way should be heard as like a partisan statement. I think you saw sort of states that are led by Republicans and states that are led by Democrats do well and really states led by both really flounder um, and, can, and, can, and continue to. I just think um, we, we don't necessarily have sort of a political class worthy of the stuff you just see day to day in terms of how Americans come together and solve problems. And that strikes me as a you know, a big, uh, a big problem for us. Emma's, you know, trying to put a dent in one piece of that with the work she's doing with Next 100. But it's a broad problem uh, that I think we, I think we have that we have to talk about. There's a we we have a we have a leadership crisis, and you know, the past four years, just because of the acute nature of it, may have, have actually distracted from just how broad that that problem is. So that's um, what makes me optimistic. Is sort of in small ways you see people doing stuff. That's great. We need to make that happen in big ways. Absolutely. And you will be invited back. Don't worry. Okay, Emma. I love that that's Andy's version of hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> come on, really? It's okay. I, it'll, make, it'll make me look good, I think, by comparison. Um, in fact, I'm going to end with the last point. Um, th things give me hope. Everything about families and educators and kids. Like, the, I totally agree. Um, the resilience of individuals has been more than anybody should be asked and amazing. And I think we'll learn from it, right? Like, I think there will be long-term lessons taken from some of the amazing educators who totally flipped the switch in 24 hours, 12 months ago, and figured out new things that we should have been doing all along. And I would add to that part of, as part of our recovery, um, there were always students who were really far behind and we weren't doing a job of giving them the resources and support they needed to accelerate their learning, right? Now we, as we said, have an America problem, but we always had this. And hopefully we'll learn something that'll help us with all of those kids that our system has not been um, serving well enough for a long time. So that gives me hope because I think we have to, so we will, right? And I think we can't ignore it anymore because it's not just other people's kids, it's everyone's kids. And I think that matters. I think the focus we have brought to equity through both the pandemic and through um, broader conversations about race is not gonna be lost now. Like nobody's not thinking about how our system serves the kids that have been left for this behind. In the education space, I know that's not new for many of us, but part of the problem is we can't do it alone, right? And I think that's now gone far beyond the education space in terms of the system's responsibility to serve those students and fund those students. Um, and then I'm going to end on Andy's last point, but turn it into a positive point, if you'll let me, and also be the political hack of the moment. Um, Andy, I agree with you, but I think we've, as a believer in government, which I am, I'm a Democrat, I have also think we've seen that leadership matters, right? And I think, like, uh, the speed with which we're just picking up things like vaccine distribution and delivery and how different that feels to real people, to me, is a real sign of hope. That's And that's not just about the Biden administration, that's about leadership at every level, too. And I think where we have seen state and local and federal leadership, people are noticing it in a different way, in part because things are so bad. And I really like take hope from that, that we'll start to believe that like, those are roles that matter. We need the right people in them and we need to support them to do the work well. And that's all of you as state board members, of course, but also the broader ecosystem you're working with. Excellent. And what gives me hope is that we have great thought partners such as Holly, Emma and Andy helping us to navigate these waters and to uh, set the path forward. So uh, that gives me hope that it's not just state board working on this, but we have some great partners such as you. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being a part of this. I wish we had another hour, uh, but I know we don't. Um, and don't worry, you all will be invited back. And uh, I hope you don't block my email from emailing, emailing asking for your help again. So it's been wonderful. Thank you so very much.